Hey everyone, and welcome to another Mastering the Draw license application strategy video. And in this video, I'm going to be touching on the non-resident opportunities that Colorado has for all the different big game species they offer. And we'll touch on what is draw only, for what species are draw only, and which ones have both over-the-counter and draw. Uh, we'll also be touching on just like other hunt opportunities that are out there for non-residents that they can get in on. Um, that aren't necessarily through the draw. Um, we'll also touch on the different private public land areas, mostly east coast or east side, west side, and the different license requirements that Colorado makes non-residents have, residents for that fact too, um, in order to hunt in their state or apply in their state, and the application dates and deadlines. So for the draw species, they have desert bighorn sheep, Rocky Mountain bighorn sheep, which they're two separate species and two separate apps, um, you, only, you can only apply for one. Uh, they have Shiras moose, mountain goat, elk, and for elk, the ones that are always a draw are the muzzleloader, first rifle, and fourth rifle. Um, archery, well, I'll, I'll touch on that in the next one, but the, the archery second and third can be over the counter too. Um, mule deer, antelope, and black bear. So those are your draw species. And I guess black bear is similar to elk. They do have some variants. They have draw application and they also have over the counter. So for the over the counter tags, we have elk, which have an either sex archery, which is considered an A tag, which I'll touch on just in a minute. Um, they have an antlerless archery, which is over the counter. And you have to, they have different units that are available for each one of those, but that's a B tag. Um, they also have second and third rifle that they have over the counter hunts for certain units as well. Um, and the reason I have that broken down in A and B tags is because in Colorado you can have one, you can have an A tag and you can have, I think, multiple B tags, but I know you can have at least one A tag and one B tag. So in that case, if you wanted an opportunity to, say, shoot a, a bull and a cow um, and not either or, you could buy an either sex archery tag and hunt either or and also have an antlerless archery tag and be able to shoot a cow and a bull. Now. The one thing you have to pay attention to which units are open for those because not all units that have either sex archery tags have antlerless archery tags. So you have to pay attention to that. So antelope, they have archery only. Um, and there's a variety of units that take place. Most of them are in that eastern side over in the plains area, but they do have some units over on the western side. Most of those units that are open the western side are going to be more fringe units of units that have antelope in it so you might get a few antelope that stray into that one but most of the most of the units on the western side do not have any type of a population or a very big population at all um, black bear they have add-on over-the-counter bear licenses which are for archery and muzzleloader and if you're looking at the regulations you can kind of dive in and look and see um, if they have a bear paw symbol next to that hunt code or that hunt or that unit, that means you can add a bear license on as an over-the-counter tag um, if you have an elk or a deer tag. So that's, that's a good thing to look at. They also have leftover limited licenses, which means they will go over the counter, but there's still a quota on the overall number of tags available. So that means these, these had set quotas but they went through the primary draw and the secondary draw. There's still lots of tags remaining, which happens more often than you would think. And there's still a lot of units out there that have leftover bear tags. Um, and in that case, you don't have to have a deer and elk tag. You can just go in and buy a, one of these leftover limited licenses over the counter, as long as there's still a quota available for them. And you can hunt during those season dates, which is defined by that on that tag. So that's one, it, it's kind of a draw tag, but there's so many units that go left over. I figured I'd mention the over the counter. Um, and the other hunt license opportunities basically comes in the form of landowner vouchers and ranching for wildlife. Now landowner vouchers, they have two and the way they describe them in Colorado parks and wildlife verbiage is non-restricted and restricted, which basically means unit wide and private land only. And that's the verbiage you'll hear most common amongst hunters is unit wide and private land only. The non-restricted is unit wide and the restricted is private land only. 
that's an important that's an important thing to pay attention to if you're in the market for a landowner tag because if you get into it where you buy a private land only tag the only property you actually have like granted access to hunt is whatever property they use to secure that landowner tag now even if that landowner has 10,000 acres if he used this block of 640 acres over here in the corner to secure that specific landowner tag and that's what that voucher is tied to um, that's the only thing that's the only piece of property you're guaranteed to hunt now you can hunt any private land within the unit so long as you get permission but you still got to acquire permission so that's why the unit wide tags are so valuable and quite often cost double or triple or quadruple the amount of private land only tags because now you can also hunt any private land so long as you get permission but the same thing goes for that one as well you still are granted access to whatever piece of private property was used to secure that unit wide tag plus you can hunt all the public land within that unit so hence the unit wide um, title now the ranching for wildlife for residents they can put in and they can draw these tags um, what they did is it's colorado Colorado looked at the landowners or the landowners they came to an agreement and they can file for these ranching for wildlife permits basically it's its own unit and they have flexible season dates things like that um, I won't dive into the resident side of it but just no residents can apply for those but non-residents the only way you can hunt ranching for wildlife is by paying and basically they say you know here's X amount of tags for your ranching for wildlife unit um, they can hunt all your private land or whatever land is dedicated in that ranching for wildlife unit and you have x amount of season dates and they give them an extended season date so they can sell these permits and space their hunters out so they don't all have to run them in and during the certain season dates that the state is subjected to in all these other units so makes it kind of nice for someone who has a little bit extra money and can afford to spend it on these permits. Now they do have them for elk, deer, antelope, moose, and bighorn sheep. So if you have the money, here's another avenue you can go in and get an awesome tag um, and go to Colorado hunting. Basically the public versus private is the east side or the eastern plains of Colorado is almost entirely private land. There is very little public land. There's some state sections out there, some state wildlife areas that you can hunt. Um, some of those are actually pretty good to hunt. There's also some national grassland areas out there that, uh, that you're able to hunt. So there is a few units out there you can take advantage of and hunt, but 90% of it is private land. So just know that going into it. Um, once you get on the western side, most all of it's public land. Now, once you get into the valley bottoms and some of those river drainages and towns and things like that, yes, obviously there's some private land parcels and some ranches and things like that. But for the most part, everything that's up in the high country, a lot of that high country, that's either forest service, um, BLM, things like that. So just pay attention to that. If you really want a DIY or a do-it-yourself hunt, the western side is going to be way better <clears throat> than the eastern side. So that's basically your public private land breakdown. Um, license requirements. So they deem this as a qualifying license. So they say that everybody that applies in the draw, be it the primary or the secondary draw, has to have a qualifying hunting license, which adult, hunt adult non-resident hunting license, that's gonna come in the form of a small games license, a small games hunting license. That's gonna be the cheapest. Same thing for youth, only the youth is considerably less. It's dirt cheap, you almost pay nothing for that small games license. And that's a qualifying license that will allow you to participate in the draw. And that's for both, either the, you know, both the primary and the secondary draw. You do have an application fee as well that's non-refundable, um, as well as a habitat stamp that is non-refundable as well. Um, you don't have to pay the tag fees unless you're successful in the draw which I guess it's, a, it's, it's not a recent change, but it kind of is. Um, it's, it's been a few years since they did that, but that definitely increased the amount of applications once they did that, but you know. Anyways, that's kind of nice because it, it makes it a little bit cheaper to apply. Um, 
as I mentioned before, the hunting license is only required to participate in the draw. Basically what I'm saying there is if you go buy an over-the-counter elk tag, um, you do not, or, or any over-the-counter tag after the draw, you do not have to buy that qualifying hunting license in order to purchase those tags that you buy over the counter. Uh, the application deadlines, early April for the primary big game draw and early July for the secondary big game draw. And that just comes along the lines of anything that's left over after the primary draw, they're gonna funnel into the secondary draw and then they're gonna have another draw. And like I say, e even if you don't apply in the primary draw, you can still participate in the secondary draw. Just remember, you do have to buy that qualifying license to participate. That's all I got for you. Um, hopefully you found this video informational and it gave you a better understanding of how Colorado conducts their, uh, their draw and what opportunities they have. If you found the information on this video helpful, remember to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.